to British Murders, a true crime podcast with a focus on British murder cases. My name's Stuart Blues, and I'm excited for you to join me on this journey of morbid discovery. I'm by no means an expert on the subjects of homicide and serial killers. However, I have always had a sick fascination with them. Together, we will learn about some of the lesser known British murderers, as well as glimpsing occasionally at some of the more notorious ones. The bite-sized presentation of this podcast is intentional, as we look to cover an overview of the respective timelines of each case succinctly. This episode of British Murders is set in the West Yorkshire city of Bradford, North West England. Bradford was actually the first city to be designated as a UNESCO City of Film in 2009. This was in part due to the city's rich film heritage and annual film festivals. The city is also home to the National Science and Media Museum. Our story's focus is 40-year-old Dale Tarbox, who at the start of 2019 was living in a flat on Independent Street in Bradford, around two miles southwest of the city centre. Dale rented the property with his 64-year-old partner, Joan Arnold. The couple had met on an online chat forum in 2017, and despite the 24-year age gap, they had been together ever since. Suffering from both anxiety and depression, Dale would often take his frustrations out in the form of violence, especially with his partners. He is known to have a short fuse and a nasty temper, which resulted in historical convictions for assault. One such conviction came after Dale punched one of his former partners in the face during a domestic dispute. Having said that, Dale hadn't been convicted of anything since 1982, when he was handed a 12-year sentence for one such offence. In January of 2019, Dale and his partner took on a lodger. I say a lodger, it was more a case of allowing this third-party individual to stay with them at their flat. The individual in question went by the name of Susan Howells. Susan was 51 years of age and rented a flat of her own in Harrogate, a North Yorkshire town. Harrogate, famous for its spa water containing iron, sulphur and salt, is located around 20 miles northeast of Bradford. Susan's health details are not readily available, so I'm unable to provide any specifics. Still, she was both physically disabled whilst also having some form of learning difficulties. Her physical condition was detrimental to the effect that, in order for her to be able to walk, she needed to make use of a Zimmer frame. Dale had known Susan since 2012 and mentioned that she was welcome to stay at the flat in Bradford whenever she liked. Susan would regularly visit Dale, even before she started living with Joan and him full-time. Susan wanted to be in a relationship with Dale, and he took full advantage of her as a result. Dale and Susan are confirmed to have slept together on December 27th, 2018. Joan, none the wiser, was away celebrating Christmas with her family. Not one for worrying or even caring about his partner finding out about the affair, Dale carried on having sexual relations with Susan. When Joan found out, he apologised before doing it again at a later date. As an incredibly vulnerable individual, Susan was the ideal target for Dale. He knew she relied on him as well as others for support in her everyday life. He controlled Susan. At one point, Dale had ordered Susan a taxi and informed her that if she didn't get in it and take herself home, he would never speak to her again. She obliged. After becoming a lodger in January 2019, Susan made a call to West Yorkshire Police after claiming to have been sexually assaulted by Dale. When questioned, Dale denied any wrongdoing, and nothing came of it. Susan would call her mum on occasion to check in and catch up, and she did just that in February 2019. Neither Susan nor her mum knew that would be the last time they ever spoke to each other. On the evening of February 19th, 2019, Susan and Dale had an argument that found its way upstairs into one of the property's bedrooms. 
The argument's details are not known, but Dale was sufficiently angered to the point where he proceeded to strangle Susan to death with his bare hands. Not knowing what to do next, Dale thought he would buy himself some time by placing Susan's body inside a wheelie bin, what we Brits call a garbage can that is kept outside for bin or garbage collection days. Dale hid the wheelie bin in the cellar or basement of the rented property in Bradford. Susan's body went undisturbed and remained undiscovered for several weeks. When Dale finally decided what he was going to do with Susan's body, he went down to retrieve it from the cellar. His idea was simple. He would burn Susan's body to make it disappear. This plan was flawed from its inception. To fully cremate a body, you need to generate some serious heat exceeding 760 degrees Celsius or 1400 degrees Fahrenheit. Those temperatures are scorching. This is achieved using a huge amount of either propane or natural gas, which is blasted down onto the corpse chest in a specially designed chamber. This is how cremation takes place in funeral homes. In stark contrast to this efficient cremation method, Dale tried to burn Susan's body by folding it in half at the waist and placing it inside a garden incinerator bin. This is a typically cylindrical metal barrel with a hole in the bottom and in the sides to allow maximum airflow. Garden waste such as weeds, hedge cutting, twigs and leaves are placed inside the incinerator bin and, with the use of some kindling in the bottom, set alight. Dale used an accelerant to help the fire on its way, but his cremation attempt was a failure. So disrespectful was Dale that he was required to force Susan's head back down into the bin after it popped out, as, realistically, her body was far too big to fit in the relatively small incinerator bin. The body was placed back in the wheelie bin and wheeled back to the cellar whilst Dale came up with a backup plan. Susan's body was left in the cellar for several more weeks in the meantime. Dale decided to secure the flat and disappear to Whitegate's Caravan Park in Doncaster, a town located around 40 miles southwest of Bradford in South Yorkshire. The couple had rented a caravan and stayed there for a few weeks while Susan's body remained undisturbed back in Bradford. The couple became close with a 61-year-old named Keith Wadsworth who was renting a neighbouring caravan in the Doncaster Park. Keith was also manipulated and taken advantage of by Dale. He was often forced to beg strangers for money on Blackpool streets, located roughly 80 miles west of Bradford and 110 miles northwest of Doncaster. Keith would then use the money he received to purchase whatever items Dale asked for. On June 11, 2019, both Dale and Keith returned to the flat in Bradford. The pair were caught on CCTV loading several items into the back of a removal van, including the wheelie bin containing Susan's body, as well as Susan's Zimmer frame. The pair drove back to the Doncaster caravan site. They buried Susan's body in a shallow grave behind Dale and Joan's rented caravan. The pair drove back to the Doncaster caravan site. They buried Susan's body in a shallow grave behind Dale and Jones' rented caravan. Susan was in the shallow grave for two months before finally being reported as missing to the police in August 2019. After launching a missing person investigation, police discovered that Dale and Joan had been collecting Susan's benefits for a period of months, to the point where they had withdrawn £3,500 from her account held with the post office. When I say benefits, what I mean is that Susan was entitled to receive some government-funded credits each month to help with her welfare due to her disabilities. Dale and Joan were soon tracked down. Police visited the caravan park in Doncaster to ask them some questions surrounding Susan's disappearance. The couple weren't at the caravan when the police turned up. However, officers noticed a wheelie bin next to a caravan with the flat number of Dale and Jones Bradford property painted on the side of it. 
Officers also spotted a metal garden incinerator bin next to it, which was in a used condition. Upon further inspection of the incinerator bin, police found clumps of human hair in it. They soon realised that this might no longer be just a missing person case. This was potentially now a murder investigation. The couple stayed in a hotel in Blackpool, whilst Keith was busy begging for money from the seaside tourists. They were soon tracked down and arrested by police on suspicion of murder and theft. Keith was also arrested, albeit on suspicion of theft only. When police confiscated Dale's personal effects after his arrest, they found several explicit videos on his mobile phone. In them, Susan Howells was performing sex acts on Dale. Dale not only proclaimed his innocence when questioned by police, he even went so far as to say that he hopes she is okay and turns up soon to clear his name. He was in a bizarre state of shock and puzzlement at the fact he'd been arrested. The reason for withdrawing such a large amount of Susan's benefit money from her post office account was that she owed Dale money. Therefore, he was withdrawing the funds to repay the debt. Dale's partner, Joan, wasn't as secretive when being questioned. She told the officer right away what had happened to Susan and that Dale was the one who killed her. She went on to say that Susan's body was buried in a shallow grave behind their rented caravan by Keith. Joan proved she was telling the truth. She accompanied officers back to the caravan site and pointed to the exact spot where Susan's body was buried. They started to dig. Soon enough, the remains of a female body were found where Joan had told them to dig. The body was completely naked. Dale had folded it in half at the waist and there was evidence of singed hair and burn marks all over. Susan's Zimmer frame was then found in the caravan's bushes shortly after her body was discovered. It was during the subsequent post-mortem that pathologists were able to determine a cause of death. It was difficult to conduct the post-mortem due to the level of decomposition of Susan's body. Still, death by fire was quickly ruled out. Susan's neck had been fractured near her Adam's apple, most likely the C3 or C4 vertebrae. Quick fact, contrary to popular belief, both males and females have laryngeal prominence, which is more commonly known as the Adam's apple. It's simply a subcutaneous prominence at the front of the throat produced by the larynx's thyroid cartilage. It increases in size when males go through puberty due to the volume of hormone changes. In females, it is still there, it's just typically either barely noticeable or not noticeable at all. Back in the interrogation room, Dale had changed his story. He pointed the finger at his partner, Joan, and claimed that she was the one who killed Susan. He explained that Susan would often walk around there flat naked, which caused many arguments between her and Joan. Further lies were told when Dale walked the officer through the chain of events minute by minute. According to Dale, Joan had attacked Susan during an argument, striking her on the head with a blunt instrument. He then said that Joan strangled Susan on their bed with what he believed to be the cord from her dressing gown. Dale then played the hero by stating that he had stopped Joan mid-attack and then fell asleep on the bed due to exhaustion. When he woke up, Susan was dead. Not satisfied with pointing the blame towards his then 63-year-old partner and showing himself as an attempted hero, Dale then told officers that Joan convinced him to keep Susan's body in the cellar of their flat. The holes in Dale's story eventually led to him pleading guilty, but only to preventing a lawful burial. Preventing a lawful burial, by which I mean burying a body before a coroner holds an inquest into the death, is an act punishable by an unlimited fine and even life imprisonment. Keith Wadsworth pleaded guilty to assisting an offender. The trial was due to commence in March 2020, however it was abandoned due to the outbreak of COVID-19. 
The trial eventually got underway eight months later at Leeds Crown Court in November 2020. The recorder of Leeds, His Honour Judge Guy Curl QC, Leeds' most senior judge, oversaw the proceedings. QC in this instance stands for Queen's Counsel, the name given to senior barristers or counsel in UK court cases. If you're found guilty of murder in the UK, you are automatically given a life sentence. That being said, life doesn't necessarily mean life in most cases. Typically, a minimum term will be handed down, which is the amount of time the guilty party must serve in prison before being eligible for parole. Michael Morley acted as the case prosecutor. Dale Tarbox was represented by Amjad Malik QC and Kitty Colley, whilst Mark McCone represented Keith Wadsworth. Joan Arnold didn't require any representation, as she ended up not being charged with anything. Prosecutor Michael Morley started by reading out a personal statement made by Julie Chadburn, the younger sister of Susan Howells. In it, Julie explained the detrimental effect Susan's murder has had on her family. Julie's elderly parents found it extremely difficult to come to terms with the death of their daughter. Julie's statement also highlighted Dale's lack of respect and remorse as damaging to her mental health. Julie also made it clear that she was appreciative of West Yorkshire Police's homicide and major inquiry team's work by thanking them in her statement. Dale's barrister, Mr Malik, in an attempt to mitigate the charges aimed at his client, acknowledged that forcing Susan's body inside a wheelie bin and leaving her hidden in the cellar for several weeks was a poor effort to hide what he had done. Mr Malik then admitted that attempting to conceal the crime by burning Susan's body was ineffective. Joan Arnold was then accused of lying about being aware of Susan's body being stored in the cellar. Mr Malik argued that she was not only completely aware of where Susan's body was being kept, but that she was also fully aware of the plan to retrieve and ultimately bury it next to the caravan in Doncaster. Keith Wadsworth was also used in the mitigation attempt. It was claimed that he wasn't simply following orders when he helped to get rid of Susan's body. Rather, he enthusiastically participated. Mr McCone, representing Keith Wadsworth, did his own mitigation. He emphasised that his client had an excellent work record and that his employer had even promised to keep his old job for him to return to once he was released from prison. The argument favouring reducing Keith's sentence was that he was being manipulated and controlled by Dale. He was following orders with no financial incentive. Keith also helped his own case by admitting his involvement in the crimes committed and assisted the police by convicting Dale. Judge Curl stated that although the motive was unclear and that the murder didn't appear to be premeditated, the victim stood no chance against Dale. He was significantly younger, bigger and stronger than her. He then said that Dale indeed exploited Keith. However, he feels that he was well aware of what he was doing. Strangely, Dale admitted in court that he buried Susan's body next to the caravan so that he could keep a close eye on her. On December 10th, 2020, Judge Curl sentenced Dale Tarbox to life imprisonment for the murder of Susan Howells and the unlawful burial of her body. He was given a minimum term to serve of 16 years before he is eligible for parole. Dale refused to attend the sentencing hearing. Keith Wadsworth was given a 10% credit for his guilty plea to preventing a lawful burial charge due to his admission of guilt and contributions towards Dale's conviction. He was sentenced to serve three years and seven months in prison for assisting an offender and the unlawful burial of Susan's body. Following the sentencing, the following statement was read by Arfak Nabi of the Crown Prosecution Service the principal public agency for conducting criminal prosecutions in England and Wales. Tarbox is a violent, volatile and manipulative individual. He has repeatedly lied about what he has done and attempted, unsuccessfully, to implicate his partner in the crime of murder. 
he took Susan Howell's life and then attempted to cover his tracks by burning her body. He also recruited another individual, Wadsworth, to assist him. However, the jury did not believe the lies he told and he has now been sentenced to life imprisonment for murder. I hope this is of some comfort to Susan's family. A statement was then read by Detective Chief Inspector Vanessa Rolfe from the Homicide and Major Inquiry team. I hope today's outcome provides some closure for Susan's family, knowing that the man who murdered her has been given a significant prison sentence. Susan regarded Tarbux as a close friend and someone she could trust, but he showed no regard for her. Taking her life in a cold and callous way, and then teaming up with Wadsworth to try and dispose of her body. He is clearly a dangerous individual, and the people of West Yorkshire should feel safer knowing he will be behind bars for many years. Not long after the trial had concluded, Solicitor General Michael Ellis QC stepped in to recommend a minimum term of 18 years rather than the 16 given during sentencing. The Solicitor General supports the Attorney General, the chief legal advisor to the Crown across the range of their responsibilities. Interestingly, Michael Ellis was promoted to the Attorney General's role from Solicitor General on March 2, 2021, when Suella Braverman became the first Cabinet Minister to take paid maternity leave. Michael Ellis QC justified this decision by stating, Tarbox murdered a vulnerable victim and showed no remorse for his despicable actions. No sentence can repair the damage he caused, but I hope the Court of Appeal's decision today gives some closure to the victim's family. Detective Chief Inspector Vanessa Rolfe praised the decision and said, We welcome this judgment by the Court of Appeal and are pleased that the decision has been made to extend the original sentence. The prison sentence is reflective of the seriousness of the offence committed and the justice deserved for Susan and her family. That was the story of British murderer Dale Tarbox. For more on British murders, please feel free to check me out on social media. The links for Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok and YouTube are all in the show notes. You can support the show every month by becoming a Patreon member where you'll get access to ad-free episodes, my scripts, raw and unedited audio, and more. Memberships start from £1 per month. Or you can support the show on a one-off basis by visiting Buy Me A Coffee. The links for both of those are in the episode description. Merchandise is available to purchase at Teespring. The link is in the show notes. You can don your British Murders swag, as I am, with my premium hoodie, which is ridiculously soft and comfy. If you do buy anything, please send me a picture and I'll make sure to share it on social media. You can email me on britishmurderspodcast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear about some case suggestions, or if you want to get in touch, you can do so there or via social media. Finally, if you could please leave me a review on iTunes if you use Apple, it would be greatly appreciated. It massively increases the show's exposure, it helps the show grow, and you will get a shout out not only on social media, but on a future episode. For now, I've been Stuart Blues. This has been British Murders. Thanks so much for listening. Until next time, cheerio.